So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, joining me to discuss the EU's response so far and that challenge ahead, uh, those things uh, that Ihor talked about there. I'm delighted to welcome, and please do come and join me on the stage as I introduce you, Rosa Balfour, uh, from, who is the director of Carnegie Europe. Rosa, do come and sit next to me. Christy Reich, director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. Yanis Emanulides, EPC deputy CEO and director of studies. And Amanda Paul, EPC senior policy analyst in the Europe in the World program. And Amanda, thank you so much for arranging uh, those, that, what, those wonderful speeches direct from Ukraine to inform our discussion. Um, you and you two are supposed to swap seats, but never mind. That's fine. To match the screen. Oh, no, it's okay. We're fine. We're fine. Okay. Right. Let us dive straight in. We don't have very long. I have lots of questions for you. I will come out to all of you with the microphone a little bit later on. But just in terms, and we heard there from the President's Office and from the Ambassador about what the EU has done, Rosa, and we heard about the challenge ahead. We'll come to the challenge. It's on. It'll come to the challenge ahead in a moment. But in terms of, of what the EU has done so far, what is your assessment of how well it has risen to the immense challenge that Russia's invasion has posed? Yeah, you have to keep it very close. There we go. So that, it should be on. Sorry, can you all check your mics are on? Sorry, I'd assume they would be. Okay. So I was just saying it depends a bit on the term on the uh, terms of reference from the Ukrainian perspective, Europe could have done more. From the US perspective, Europe could do more. Um, but I think com by comparison to where Europe and I mean the EU and its member states were on the twenty third of February, mm. I think we do need to acknowledge that it has been a watershed moment, as uh, Fabian was saying, um, and that's on all. Uh, from all points of view, security, uh, humanitarian, support of refugees, um, decisions made, the speed with which they were made, the way in which the EU uh, worked with the UK and yeah. with the US on providing this, this is actually quite extraordinary. Um, so yes, as I said, you know, from the point of view of pushing back uh, Russia, the, the job is not over and it's certainly not enough, but from by comparison to where the EU was, Absolutely. then a lot has been achieved. Quite remarkable. Uh, Christy, would that be your assessment as well? And when we look to the future uh, and those key areas where we heard from the President's office on weapons, on sanctions, on financial support, um, does the EU need to do a lot more than it has done already? Uh, how do you see the challenge ahead? Of course, the EU needs to do more. And uh, it is not looking good, but the US has been done so much more than Europe to support Ukraine, not only militarily, but also in other respects. Uh, so indeed, uh, more has to be done, but uh, we also have to give credit to the EU for everything that is it has done and really changing course in very fundamental issues and looking to the future of European security. I would also stress, like some of the previous speakers, uh, the candidate country status for Ukraine. This is hugely important and it really shows that the EU is becoming a geopolitical actor in ways it never was before. And it is giving up this uh, position of strategic ambiguity that it used to have for many years with regard to countries situated between the EU and Russia. And this position of strategic ambiguity was actually um, partly to blame for why we ended up in this situation of having a major war once again in Europe, because the way Russia read this position was that it was encouraged to move ahead with its efforts to impose its uh, sphere of influence on neighbors mm. by force. And this must not be allowed to happen. Absolutely. And question is whether there will be a temptation to return to that ambiguity over time. But we'll come back on that. Yanis, uh, your assessment of the EU's response so far and those three pillars of support uh, that uh, Ihor was talking about, so crucial already, but he's calling for even more now. How do you see the challenge ahead? Well, I think that um, both Christy and Rosa are right in terms of analyzing of how we reacted to the immediate uh, watershed moment that we witnessed on the 24th of February. 
um, our reaction was faster, more decisive than we have been in other um, phases and chapters of what we always call the perma crisis. Um, however, I think it still is a mixed bag. There's much more that can be done uh, with respect to the three elements which uh, were mentioned earlier. Um, there is more that can be done in terms of assisting the country to uh, defend itself um, to move towards uh, what uh, was called the victory. Um, there's more that can be done in terms of economics, um, in terms of economic assistance. Um, so when it comes to Ukraine, there's a lot that still needs to be done and that needs to be done now immediately. Um, but there's also more to be done in terms of us preparing um, to implement what we have granted to, to Ukraine, which is the candidate status. So there's a lot of things we need to do um, also with respect to the reforming the EU itself and making becoming true what we have promised to Ukraine and also uh, enhancing uh, the enlargement pro policy in general. Um, but as a last point, I think there is a discrepancy in terms of a lot of uh, rhetoric about the watershed moment about Seitenwende um, and about the actual policies on the ground. Um, and that goes beyond uh, the support for Ukraine, because if it is a watershed, if it is a Titan there are things that will have to be done and questions that have to be addressed, which go far deeper. Let me come back to we that. are not doing that. Yeah, yet. let me come back. I want to focus just still for a moment, Amanda, on uh, the support for Ukraine, the immediate issues uh, that we heard about there from the president's office, but also some of those longer term issues. Uh, he talked about post-war reconstruction and that needing that work needing to start now talking looking at security guarantees a range of issues do you think the eu at the moment is is able to combine that short term meeting of challenges and how do you see them with that longer term thinking to prepare for he said we will survive we will come out of this we will come out stronger is the eu preparing for that day well enough I mean, okay, I think that you... Can you hold it right sorry. up? Sorry, the acoustics uh, are... First of all, I want to agree with the other speakers. I think a lot of taboos have been broken, um, but I would still only give the EU, if I was grading it, let's say seven out of 10, because too much precious time was lost and is still being lost. There needs to be a more proactive approach. It's still far too um, reactionary, which um, is worrying. I do believe that the EU understands now the areas where the key focus needs to be placed. The reconstruction um, is crucial, but so is ongoing delivery of weapons. I mean, these things are linked. Um, and the reconstruction is also directly relinked to Ukraine's accession process. And this needs to be started ASAP. Mm, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and as we look to the future, Christy, I mean, in terms of this longer term future uh, and this issue of candidate status, very struck uh, being called there, not a, a civil, not, not just about membership, he said. He said, this is a civilizational choice. In terms of preparing for that, in terms of post-war reconstruction, do you think, uh, what does the EU need to do in order to combine this urgent short-term need with the long-term challenge? First of all, I think it is crucial to keep the process going. And I don't think we have a fully united view in European capitals on how important this is to keep Ukraine motivated. As we heard, Ukrainians are determined to do the reforms. So they want to start the accession negotiations. They need to have a credible membership perspective. We can't say exactly when membership will be fully completed, but they have to be keep moving in that direction. And that will be really a key issue of building European security for the future decades. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just about like abstract notions of spheres of influence and, and uh, achieving a new balance of power, but it's about how millions of people live their lives. Mm -hmm. you know, I was a teenager when my country, Estonia, was liberated from the Soviet occupation and re-established its independence. And it has been 30 years of, you know, becoming integrated to the Western structures and kind of leaving behind a society that was constantly under fear, where you did not have freedom, you did not have justice. This is what we must not allow to be returning to the neighboring countries of Europe. That's what Ukraine wants to get away from. Mm. And that's where then for the EU's credibility, it's a crucial issue to make that happen. And in terms of that long-term challenge, Rosa, and the EU's unity, 
because there has been remarkable unity, but we heard uh, um, Eeyore alluded to cracks in that unity when he talked about financial support and the 8 billion euro aid package and said, I hope you will be able to agree it. Um, the EPC has dubbed this the ambition unity dilemma. Uh, and how far do you push to do what you need to do, both short and long term, uh, versus keeping everyone together? How do you see reconciling that? And do you think we can find a way forward that will maintain the level of support they need short and long term? I mean, I'm amongst those who's quite optimistic about the EU's ability to hold that unity. And I think it's quite remarkable that in talking about peace recently, it was the US that blinked first, not, not Europeans. Europeans hold the line. We can only start talking about peace when it is Ukrainians. As the ambassador exactly. underlined very clearly. I, absolutely. Um, let's just focus a little bit, because that they're on speaking of uh, enlargement, perhaps, let's just look at what the EU has done and not done in the Western Balkans, because I'm a little bit concerned. On the one hand, the um, uh, the morale impact of starting accession talks as soon as possible is fundamental. And Ukrainians have have all have have demonstrated a European aspiration in 2004 with the Orange Revolution in 2014, and now and now. So it's absolutely fundamental to focus on that. But at the same time, working on the Balkans, I have seen the optimism about the EU and the enthusiasm about the EU plummet in recent years because the EU has not has it's not just hasn't been united but it's actually that you know member states have posed mm -hmm. have imposed vetoes on the basis of bilateral issues on the basis of purely domestic politics on really on the basis of very minor issues by comparison to the strategic importance yeah. of enlargement so i am concerned that at some point in the context of be it war fatigue or be it um you know stalemate uh, fatigue be it uh, cost of living uh, uh, fatigue, et cetera, et cetera, I think cracks might start to show. Mm. So I do think at some point, um, aside from the morale issue and, and the sort of communication, um, at some point the EU does need to sit down and think hard about how do we actually enlarge? How do we put this in practice in a way that it, it, that is um, credible? for the partners. And that applies okay. to both Western Balkans and, and mm. Eastern partners. They both, they need to be associated in this process. Thank you. Amanda, in terms of that ambition unity dilemma, and you said, you know, you give them uh, the EU a good mark, but not the best of marks. Uh, what for you is the key to resolving that dilemma in future and making sure that the EU does deliver the 18 billion euro, it does continue to deliver on sanctions, on weapons and those long-term issues, but stays together and cannot be exploited by President Putin, who will look for any gap he can find. And as you said, wasn't the EU who began maybe to talk in terms he would see as encouraging? I mean, the obvious answer is to say, you know, political will um, and unity that all member states should, you know, really understand the full consequences of this war and what it means for Europe um, as a whole. I mean, I still have doubts in my mind when I travel around different EU member states that this is the case, not just from the leaderships, um, but also from citizens. I mean, I've found some terrible understandings um, of what they think this war is about. Mm. Um, there's still too much um, access to Russian disinformation in the media space, unfortunately. So there is a, an, a bigger obligation, I think, for member states to give a clearer picture to better communicate, but to remain determined because the policy of the past has been totally ignorant, um, totally arrogant in some ways. I mean, some member states totally dismissed um, the opinions of other member states who turned out to be right. And I'm talking about the Baltics, about the states on the eastern flank. Um, there was a very arrogant approach towards that. So this needs to be changed. Everybody needs to be on the same page. I mean, that is obviously the first thing. But I mean, if you can't get that, um, then we need to move towards this um, reform um, of the voting system, mm -hmm. which is also, you know, not exactly straightforward, but it's something that needs to be done for many different reasons. Um, if we're going to be able to, I think, progress with effective enlargement policy and effective you know, foreign policy. Um, if the EU is to become a really meaningful geopolitical player, 
um, if we even if they even understand what that actually means. There needs to be a change in thinking, but a change in the actual system of decision making within the EU. Yeah. And Yanis, coming back to the point you made earlier, the EPC has also described Russia's invasion as the end of the age of innocence. I quote. What does that mean? Do you believe the EU was naive before? And if it was, um, what does the end of the age of innocence mean in practice? And, and this point you made about waking up to the enormity of the challenge. Well, first of all, I think that not only the EU or the EU 27, i.e. also its member states were naive. There was a lot of naivety. Um, and if you look um, into the mistakes which were committed after 2008, which were committed after 2014, and uh, the fact that we did not realize um, that uh, there is not an end to the story after 2014, and that we were being warned about potentially what might happen in 2022 and what then happened in February, there is a lot um, and many to be blamed for their naivety. Um, and so we've lost that innocence, which we sometimes had in terms of how we were analyzing and not reacting adequately to what potentially might happen. Mm -hmm. And that is something which I also fear now, if I look further in the longer term, um, I fear that we are often saying things where we are not always 100% honest and are not also fully convicted of what it will need in order to get there. So if you look into enlargement, if you look into the promise which we have now given to the Ukrainians, which we have given also to Moldova, uh, Moldova um, we need to prepare for that. Are we doing that? Question mark. Um, how much are we ready to uh, actually do what is needed in order to progress with the enlargement policy? As Rosa was saying, do we learn from the mistakes which we've committed with respect to the enlargement policy in the Western Balkans, where we were saying you have the perspective of joining, but then we were under-delivering uh, under in strong ways on our side. Um, so I think we need to learn these lessons. Uh, and when it comes to a Ukraine and enlargement, we have to understand that this has now become a strategic imperative. One needs to be careful when doing historical comparisons. But if I look into 89 or after 89 and 90, at some point we had realized that the EU will have to enlarge. It's a question of when and how we prepare these countries to join and how we prepare ourselves in order to have countries joining the European Union. Now I think we haven't fully realized or not doing what is needed in order to understand that enlargement has become a strategic imperative. Mm -hmm. And there are some who even think that maybe we can still avoid it. Maybe we can move ourselves in a situation where Ukraine after the war uh, might yep. not be ready to join, might not be ready to move in the direction which is needed. Um, and that would be a strategic mistake. And that would be naive. And then we would have again thought about the consequences of what we're now witnessing after the watershed moment in a very innocent way rather ask, than being realistic. Ask about those consequences. But before I do, any questions or comments from our audience? Anyone want to briefly come in at this point? Let me just come down into the room. It's always good for me to get a little bit of exercise and I will come round to you. And could I ask you please to introduce yourself and please be as brief as possible. We don't have very long. Nice to see you. Good morning, uh, Justus Schönlau. Um, th the question to any member of the panel really is, uh, we heard about the challenges for Ukraine and the EU, and we also had the debate before the war on the challenges for democracy in the European Union, i.e. with the Conference on the Future of Europe. Now, now the member states seem to be telling us there's no time for big democratic reform because we need to sort out the Ukraine issue first. So what's your point of view on the sequencing? Do we do first democracy, then Ukraine, and then the future of Europe, or do we do it the other way around, or everything at the same time? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, let us come back uh, on that point. Who would like to, to come in? Okay, uh, uh, I think this, it's not one thing excludes the other. The two need to be done together. In fact, they're deeply interconnected. This dichotomy that, you know, there's internal reform has to take place before um, enlargement actually is wrong. Every enlargement has seen um, more integration. And now I think the key issue really is about democracy. Um, but we can't address, we, we can't, you know, we can't just enlarge for geopolitical reasons because that would backfire if uh, democratic standards have not been um, have been overlooked, and I think what's happening today, um, and the, uh, with the debate over the rule of law and the way in which some member states are viewing the deterioration of of the rule of law internally as an excuse to pursue enlargement further, that's problematic. So we need to, uh, you know, demine this issue before. 
um, you know, we need to take, we need to, we need to make sure that the two are interconnected and make sure they're addressed uh, simultaneously. Christy? Yeah, I think that is going to be one of the difficult issues in the coming years that the EU will be going through debates on what kind of internal reforms are needed before further enlargement can take place. And we know that there are different uh, views among member states as to how far we can go with deepening integration and how to do it, how far to extend the use of qualified majority vote, for example. And there are other, other issues that need to be addressed in parallel with moving ahead with the enlargement process. Janis, you wanted to come in. Yes, I have um, a fundamental problem with the narrative which we're using now in terms of time. We often hear it's not the right time to do X, Y, or Z. We will do it when we get to the point where we have to do it. Like when it comes to the absorption capacity of the EU, we will prepare ourselves for enlargement when the moment of enlargement will be approaching and the pressure will be there. I think that's just one example. And we hear that more often in terms of it's not the right moment now. And I think this is a flawed argument. One, because it takes time to get there. So let's uh, not assume that you can wait that long as some assume that we can wait. And um, second, you're giving the wrong signal because you're actually not providing a message and also a response for those who want us to do more. Look at, at Kiev. Uh, we're not saying that we're not ready to now do to reform the EU is giving the wrong signal. Um, and I think also that we are having and increasingly we're having these cracks between member states because we are not addressing key questions which are dividing us like the perspective for Ukraine, but also what the further consequences of the watershed moment is. And that because we're avoiding to have these honest debates among each other, because we're saying we need to now be united and that would be disuniting yep. us. And we are creating problems already today, because if we have fundamental uh, questions and issues which we're not addressing, the, and that creates distrust okay. among member states, and it makes it more difficult for them to take the decisions of today. So there are different aspects of this time argument, which I'm not buying into. Thank you very much. Amanda, a comment to this, but also the consequences for Ukraine, if the EU, if that unity does not hold, if we cannot combine the ambition that we're talking about, the promises that we're making uh, with delivery uh, of those ambitions, what would the consequences be and how does the EU avoid that? I mean, the consequences for Ukraine, if this unity doesn't hold, I mean, if it crumbles, are extremely serious because at the end of the day, we're risking Ukraine as a state. I mean, Ukraine is doing fabulously well um, in this war but it is dependent, I mean, its continuing success is dependent on support from partners, including the EU. So we should be boosting our support, um, not going backwards. And this needs to be maintained. And also, we don't need a grey zone. We had a grey zone um, in the middle of Europe for many years. This was a serious mistake. It undermined our own security, uh, never mind the security of Ukraine, Moldova and the other countries. This grey zone has to be a thing of the past. This is why it is so important that the commitment to Ukraine um, for membership goes beyond being on a piece of paper or words. It actually needs to take place. Mm. And a final question to you all before we move on, and I'll start this time with you, Amanda. Coming back to Herman Van Rompuy, who warned, asked the question, is the EU doomed to stand by powerless? For each of you to avoid that fate, what is the key priority now to respond to this watershed moment, this loss of innocence uh, that we talked about? What for each of you is the most important thing? Amanda. I think it's to act like the geopolitical actor it wants to be. It wants to be geopolitical, but there's still a gap between wanting to do it and actually transforming this into real concrete action that we actually believe. I'm still waiting for that. They need to hurry up. Thank you. Yanis. Two things. One, um, with respect to Ukraine, um, not to think that we're doing this for the sake of Ukraine. Yes, we're supporting and we have to support Ukraine, um, but we're supporting Ukraine all out of enlightened self-interest. It is in our deep interest to be supporting Ukraine because if we don't, there will be massive consequences 
on, in many aspects, and that's geopolitical, it's geoeconomic, it covers the whole array of policy areas, there will be a lot of negative consequences if we don't deliver on what we should be delivering. And the second thing is um, we need to have an honest debate about the things which are dividing us among the EU27. We're avoiding that debate, and I think it's creating problems already today, and uh, it's creating problems in terms of our readiness to do what needs to be done in the upcoming years. And I do not want to find ourselves in a couple of years down the road asking ourselves, why didn't we react adequately to the 24th of February, not only with respect to Ukraine, but also with respect to Ukraine, um, on, on with respect okay. to the different uh, challenges which we're facing, because then we will be too late. And then we will be asking ourselves, why we didn't we do something which we should have done earlier? That would be a grave mistake, a strategic mistake. Thank you very much. Christy. Well, I think Europe, including the EU and member states, are only starting to get mentally and materially, also militarily fit to survive in the current world of geopolitical competition where our values and our norms are contested. And if we want to be able to defend them, and it is in our interest, of course, to be able to defend them, we also need power and we also need force. And we are only in the beginning of uh, building this up. Thank you very much. Rosa, you have the last word. Yeah, it's always hard to have the last word. But I think generally looking at the response to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this is a whole of government response. And this leads me to think, you know, there's a lot of talk about power. And I think the EU is a system power. Um, and it's not just a geopolitical power. It's not just a normative power. It's not just a civilian power. It's a system power. And it needs to think in those terms. It needs to maintain that ability to use a diverse toolbox. It needs to maintain that ability to be a multiplex power, they say, in the academic literature, to look at things, issues from multiple levels uh, upwards and downwards, but also horizontally in terms of policy spread. So I think actually thinking about, you know, the present geopolitical context in systemic terms and not just in terms of geopolitical response, I think that that is the key to making sure that you put together short term and long term challenges. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed? Um,